A reading from the epistle to the first, first epistle to the Corinthians. By the authority of our Savior Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my friends, to agree in what you say, so that there will be no divisions among you. Be completely united with only one thought and one purpose. For some people from Chloe's family have told me quite plainly, my friends, that there are quarrels among you. Let me put it this way. Each one of you says something different. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Peter. And another, I follow Christ. Christ has been divided into groups. Was it Paul who died on the cross for you? Were you baptized as Paul's disciples? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. No one can say then that you were baptized as my disciples. Oh yes, I also baptized Stephanus and his family, but I can't remember whether I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to tell the good news and to tell it without using any, the language of human wisdom in, in order to make sure that Christ's death on the cross is not robbed of its power. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The word, word of God for the people of God. Thank you. So there is a moment in queer history that I really wish we talked about more. It goes like this. In 1973, the New York City Christopher Street March featured a change of plans. Every other year, both before and after, the march started in the village and ended at Columbus Circle, right off of a Central Park. This year, the march started in Columbus Circle and ended with a big rally in Washington Square Park in the village. The rally was emceed by writer and activist Vito Russo. Now, I'm not sure the order this happened in, but here's how I think it went from the information I've been able to find. Vito Russo was emceeing the gay liberation rally and people were generally in good spirits. And at a certain point, Sylvia Rivera herself asks for a moment on the mic. And there's a bit of an uproar in the crowd. So a few of the folks on stage, presumably the organizers of the event, Asked the crowd right out if they'd like to hear what Rivera had to say. There were a number of cheers, and so Rivera came up on stage, got on the mic, and said, y'all better quiet down. And this starts an epic five or six minute speech of hers in which she calls out the queer community for failing to take care of their own. She says that herself and people like her, poor queer people, queer people of color, sex workers, drag queens and trans women, people like her were regular be, regularly being beaten, raped, and arrested with such regularity that it became habitual for them. She says that she and her sisters had been on the front lines of queer liberation and have dearly paid the price for it, but the queer community at large ignored them, excluded them, looked down on them, and did nothing to help them. She ends by calling out specifically the white, middle-class, queer people who have not shown an ounce of care for Rivera and her compatriots. And then she invites the entire crowd to visit the home of the street transvestite action revolutionaries on 12th Street. Following Sylvia, or proceeding based on some accounts, but this is the version of events that makes sense to me, Following Sylvia, a lesbian feminist activist by the name of Jean O'Leary took the stage. O'Leary begins by pointing out that she had worked hard with several other lesbian feminist activists to draft their own statement to be read at the rally, but that when they had asked, they were told that there would be no political speeches. Then, lo and behold, Sylvia Rivera wants to give a political speech and the doors open wide. O'Leary takes aim at misogyny in the queer community, how women's voices have been continually undermined. She makes several comments, unfortunately, expressing the view that drag queens, many of whom would probably call themselves trans women today but didn't have the language at the time, that they made a mockery of what it means to be a woman, 
and she rejected the ways in which society at large likes to tell women who they are. At this point, things are very tense. The crowd is getting angry and making noise, and there are more people who want to ascend the stage and say their own piece, which is near guaranteed to upset the crowd in several other directions. Things are looking rough. Vito Russo is just trying to keep everyone calm, and he wants to let the speakers express their thoughts, but the more expression happens on the mic, the more tense things get. I mentioned this historical moment first because I think it's a great story and one that showcases the early stages of several rifts in the queer community we still see today. Trans women and sex workers are still those of us most likely to face violence and still largely ignored by the wider queer community. Women's voices are still undervalued, and some women still take this out on trans women and seek to exclude them from women's spaces. We are still having all of these conversations 50 years later. More importantly, though, I see a lot of parallels between this community and the community of the church in Corinth. Both have grown impressively in their numbers and their influence in a short time. Both are still facing considerable oppression by the state and the wider culture. And as you can see, both struggled with conflicting factions within the wider community. In New York, those factions were largely based on political identity whether one is a gay man or a lesbian or gender non-conforming. Whereas in Corinth, the debates were largely over whom one followed within the Jesus movement. Whether one's allegiance was to Paul or to Peter or to Apollos, which seems a tad silly because Paul and Peter and Apollos were all on the same team. But I suppose it's not surprising that each follower would have their personal favorite among the well-known figures in the movement. And 1 Corinthians is a favorite of mine specifically because so much of it has to do with the question of how we live in community with one another. How do we better show love to one another? And how do we stay one body when we are beset upon by danger from without? To me, though, this conversation is all about labels, which are a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, no one wants to be put in a box, and we all know that it doesn't feel good when someone else tries to tell you who you are. On the other hand, though, I don't think we talk enough about how much we like putting labels on ourselves. I'm a Virgo. I'm an Enneagram 6. I'm an ENFP. I'm an air nomad. I'm a Democrat. None of those things are me, for the record. That's just examples. Um, insert your own category here. We love these tiny little labels because they tell us who we are. They give us a reason to feel a little special about ourselves. Often we even love the bigger labels, especially the ones that others have tried to use to shame us. I relish calling myself fat even though it is a limiting label, because people have been using my size to shame me since I was seven years old. And I like the feeling of saying, yes, you are right. I am a fat person and I am not ashamed of that. And just about everyone in this room knows the power invoked in speaking just those few words. I'm a lesbian, I'm trans, I'm gay, I'm non-binary, I'm pansexual. We know the power in these words. But these are all labels we claim because we're proud to be who we are and because we're even prouder to be who we are in a world that has worked so hard to shame us for it. There are benefits to the labels we claim, otherwise we wouldn't claim them. They give us a sense of identity and they give us a place to belong. They give us a community where we aren't judged. They give us connections to people with shared experiences so that we can know we're not alone in what we've been through. I'm sure that in Corinth too, claiming one's brand of Christianity was a source of identity formation and belonging. Peter's people could get together and talk about what it's like being a Peter Christian. Apollos' people could band together to support each other. The problem is, in using a label to foster a sense of belonging, you inherently draw a line around the people who don't belong. Which means there are people left out even within the community. 
Do you know Leary didn't want Sylvia Rivera or Marsha P. Johnson giving her speech, uh, <laughs> Marsha P. Johnson in her spaces? The rally organizers didn't initially want Gene O'Leary giving a speech on stage. I don't know the specifics of the church in Corinth, but I think it's reasonable to expect that Paul's people and Peter's people and Apollos' people had some tensions between them. Forming in-groups creates out-groups. And then those out-groups will inevitably form their own groups. Now you've got several communities within one community with different needs and different viewpoints, and now we're having to talk about the strife within our community instead of working out how we'll respond to the strife coming from outside. Now, I don't want to say that we can't have any separate communities within communities. For instance, some might take this moment to bemoan the different denominational divisions in the wider Christian church. I don't take issue with that. I consider myself very ecumenical, but at the same time, I'm not going to feel as close to God at an Episcopalian service as I will here. It's not my tradition. Some people encounter God in high church liturgy, and that's fine. I don't, and that's also fine. Furthermore, not all denominational divisions are purely voluntary. I am standing here at a pulpit surrounded by rainbows precisely because people like me were excluded from the wider church. And through that exclusion, we found each other and our own community. But as important as that community is to me, it was not a choice. Moreover, without our labels, who are we? What is the church? if we don't have something to build ourselves around. It's all well and good to welcome everyone, but the paradox of tolerance exists. It's nice to highlight our unity in Christ, but there are plenty of other things we should probably be united in as well. We should be united in believing that we should treat all people with kindness and grace. We should be united in believing that human life has worth. We should be united in believing that God loves us, all of us especially those who haven't been shown enough love by the rest of the world. When I see someone on the sidewalk with a big sign telling everyone they're going to hell, I don't think it's wrong that I don't want to include that guy in the word Christian. When someone uses the Bible to co-sign their cruelty, I don't think it's wrong to want to exclude them from the church. When someone commits violence against another in the name of Christ, I believe we have a right to take the name of Christ away from them. If we do away with our labels entirely, then we become meaningless. The Bible is a large book, and there are a lot of verses about welcoming the stranger, and there are also a lot of verses about genocide, and I don't particularly want people in my church who favor the latter over the former. In this vacuum that would come with a labelless Christianity is all too easily seized by those who would be most destructive with the power to misinterpret. In fact, these false teachers are primarily what Paul is concerned about in this text. There are a couple verses in the reading that seem a bit out of place at first glance. Paul tells us that Christ sent him to preach the gospel not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. And I didn't get that at first. But this doesn't appear to have much to do with divisions in the community until you consider that the divisions in the community all seem to do with whose example one follows, whose teachings one emphasizes, whose eloquent wisdom speaks to the heart of each Corinthian. Paul is no big fan of identity politics, as he tells us elsewhere, but this conversation isn't directly about identity. This conversation is about rooting our identity in following other people. Paul doesn't want the church in Corinth to be swayed by smooth talkers who can say all the right things to make you believe all the wrong things. Paul doesn't want someone else's eloquent wisdom to supplant Christ's place in our lives. Because another way we form our identities is through whom we are fans of. And this may sound harmless, but if you don't think it can be dangerous, I invite you to go to Twitter Go to any post Elon Musk has ever made and criticize him so you can see all of the reply guys come in to savage you. If you don't think that's dangerous, I invite you to say something negative about any gay man's favorite diva. If this doesn't sound dangerous, 
I invite you to go find the Swifties and tell them you like any other musician better. If you do, you will be surprised by how much people can see a critique of their idol as an attack on their own identity. In the church, too, this still rears its ugly head. There are still people out there hanging on every word Mark Driscoll says because following him is now a part of their identity. There are people giving away their life savings because Joel Osteen told them it would come back tenfold. And there are still plenty of Christians out there who think you deserve to go to hell if you don't like Donald Trump because they've rooted their identity not in Christ, not on the cross, but in the teachings of another Christian. And it can be easy for another Christian to convince you that their understanding of the Bible is the right one, even when it's not. All it takes is some fancy words and you forgetting what God's voice sounds like. Paul would say that our identity is solely in Christ. I don't think I would go that far. But I think it's important to remember that our first identity, our core identity, is as a child of God. And I may be a child of God who loves John Wesley, and you may be a child of God who loves God, John Calvin, and someone else may be a child of God who loves John Paul II. I don't have a problem with that so long as we don't allow our love of these men to supplant our love of Christ. So long as we don't start to look at ourselves as the better Christians, so long as we don't begin to see our fellow Christians as separate from ourselves. What's important in communities, and especially communities facing adversity, is that we don't allow our differences to make us forget what we have in common. That as Christians, we are focused on following Christ above all else. That as a queer community, we believe in standing against queer phobia more than we believe in forming our own separate camps. That we are bound together by love and respect more than we are divided by difference. It is this remembering of our common cause that brings a community together in the midst of strife. For example, earlier I didn't finish the story of the 1973 rally in Washington Square. You see, just when things looked most tense, when the crowd was approaching mob status, just when chaos threatened to descend over the whole affair, I kid you not, Bette Midler came on stage. She was, now at this time, Bette Midler had already been performing in bathhouses for a while. So she was known to those assembled as someone who supported the queer community. And in word and in action, and in someone who was allied with us in our struggle against bigotry. And Bette Midler stood in the midst of this very tense crowd and sang a couple songs. And when she was done, the conflicts quieted it down, just enough to dispel the tension in the air. They didn't stop. They still haven't stopped. We are still having these conversations today, and we need to. We need to have these conversations because it's the only way to know how to take care of the most vulnerable among us. But more importantly, in the midst of those difficult conversations, we must remember what unites us. Whether that is unity through Christ or unity through Bette Midler, we must remember that the things we have in common, the struggles we go through together, the perils we face, we must remember that these things are more important than our different labels. Thank you. It's the time in our service where we collect an offering to those attending MCC Boston through our YouTube page. You too can participate by going to our website at mccboston.org and clicking on the donate button there for that purpose. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Members and friends of MCC Boston in Micah chapter six, verse eight, we are called to do justice, show kindness and live humbly with God. Metropolitan Community Churches are doing just that through our bold mission to transform hearts, lives, and history, just as Jesus did. As part of that call, MCC recognizes a state of need around the world in the areas of human rights and justice. As people of faith, we have a responsibility to act on behalf of those who cannot affect change on their own. As MCC, we endeavor to build bridges that liberate and unite voices of sacred defiance. 
As queer Christians, we are called to stand in solidarity with those who are marginalized and oppressed, to be partners in working for change, to be witnesses who call attention to human rights abuses, and to be of a voice in the international community for justice. Metropolitan Community Church is in the business of responding to issues of injustice in our world. For God tells us in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verse 15, that when we carry out justice, we are agents of divine will. My friends, you are a part of the movement that is MCC. A portion of your tithes and offerings each week helps support our denomination in carrying out this important work. As queer Christians, we know what it's like to be disadvantaged, even here in America. Our queer siblings abroad face much worse persecution and even death. So this week, give thanks for the witness of MCC and pray for MCC's continued success. For now, as the basket is presented, please give as you are able, and may the God, and know that God, um, excuse me, and may God continue to bless you and MCC Boston. Thank you. <laughs> 